In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. We begin with our Lord Maria for heavenly assistance. O Maria, gracia plena, dominus tecum, benedicta turnibus, et benedictus fructus ventis tu, Jesus. We just heard from St. John's Gospel on this Good Friday, the Passion. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. As St. Alphonse Liguri explains, there's nothing more to be said, says St. John the Evangelist, of the martyrdom of Our Lady. Behold her at the foot of the cross, looking on her dying son, her dying son Jesus, and then see if there is grief like her grief. Let us stop then also today on Calvary to consider this fifth, fifth sword that pierced the heart, the heart of Mary, namely the death of Jesus. As soon as our afflicted Redeemer had descended the mountain of Calvary, the executioners stripped him of his garments and piercing his sacred hands and feet with nails, not sharp but blunt, as St. Bernard explains, in order to torture him more, they fastened him to the cross. And when they had crucified him, they planted the cross and thus left him to die. The executioners abandoned him, but the Blessed Virgin Mary does not abandon our Lord. She then draws closer to the cross in order to assist at his death. As our Blessed Lady revealed to St. Bridget, she said, I did not leave him and stood near to his cross. But what did it avail, O lady, says St. Bonaventure, to go to Calvary to witness there the death of this son? Shame should have prevented thee, for his disgrace was also thine, because thou wa wast his mother, or at least the horror of such a crime as that I've seen a God crucified by his own creatures should have prevented thee from going to the cross. But St. Adventure himself answers this question, or this inquiry. Thy heart did not consider the horror, but rather the suffering. Oh, thy heart did not then care for its own sorrow, but instead cared for the suffering and death of thy dear son, Jesus, and therefore thy thyself did wish to be near him at the foot of the cross, at least to compassionate him during his passion. And William the Abbot says, O true mother, a loving mother, for not even the death, the, the, sorry, the terror of death could separate thee from thy beloved son. But oh, what a spectacle of sorrow to see the son in, then in agony upon the cross. And under the cross, this mother also in agony, who was suffering all the pain that her son was suffering at the same time. Behold the words in which the Blessed Virgin Mary revealed to St. Bridget, and explaining the pitiable state of her, divine, her dying son as she saw him on the cross with her own eyes. She said, My dear Jesus was on the cross in grief and in agony. His eyes were sunken, half closed, and lifeless, the lips hanging, and the mouth open, the cheeks hollow and attached to the teeth, the face lengthened, the nose sharp, the countenance sad, the head had fallen upon his breast, the hair black with blood, the stomach collapsed, the arms and legs stiff, and the whole body covered with wounds and blood." End of quote. The Blessed Virgin Mary also suffered all these pains of our Lord, which he suffered in his body. Every torture inflicted on the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, says St. Jerome, 
There was also a wound in the immaculate heart of the mother. Any one of us should have then have been on, who should, have, should then have been on Mount Calvary, would have seen two altars, says St. John Chrysostom, on which two great sacrifices were consummated, one in the body of Jesus and the other in the heart of Mary. But St. Bonaventure says something more. He says, rather, I see there one altar only, namely the cross alone of the Son, on which with the victim, this divine lamb, the mother was also was sacrificed. Therefore, St. Bonaventure interrogates her in these words. O lady, where art thou? Near the cross? Nay, on the cross. Thou art crucified with thy son. And St. Augustine also says the same thing. He says, the cross and the nails of the son were also the cross and nails of the mother. Christ being crucified the mother was also crucified. And St. Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux says, yes, because love inflicted on the heart of Mary the same suffering that the nails caused in the body of Jesus. Therefore, at the same time that the son was sacrificed in his body, the mother, as St. Bernardino says, was sacrificing her soul. St. Avalanches the Greece continues with this description of this dolor, Mary at the cross. He says, but what increased most the sorrows which Mary suffered through compassion for her son was to hear him complain on the cross that even the eternal father had abandoned him when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Words which, as our Blessed Mother herself said to St. Bridget, could never depart from her mind during her whole life. Thus, the afflicted mother saw her Jesus suffering on every side. She desired to comfort him, but she could not. And what caused her the greatest sorrow was to see that by her presence and her grief, she increased the sufferings of her son. St. Bernard says, the sorrow itself that filled the heart of Mary increased the bitterness of sorrow in the heart of Jesus. St. Bernard also says that Jesus on the cross suffered more from compassion for his mother than from his own pains. He thus speaks in the name of the Virgin when he says, I stood and looked upon him and he looked upon me. And he suffered more for me than for myself, than for himself. The same saint, also speaking of Mary, of Mary beside her dying son, says that she lived dying without being able to die. Near the cross stood his mother, speech, speechless. Living, she died. Dying, she lived. Neither could she die because she was dead, being yet alive. Pacino writes that Jesus Christ himself, speaking one day to the blessed Baptista Verana of Camerino, said to her that he was so afflicted on the cross at the sight of his mother, in such anguish at his feet, that compassion for his mother caused him to die without consolation. So the blessed Baptista, being enlightened to know the suffering of Jesus, exclaimed with the words, O my Lord, tell me no more of this thy sorrow, for I cannot bear it. Simon of Cassia says, Men were astonished when they saw this mother then keep silence without uttering a complaint in this great suffering. But if the lips of Mary were silent, her heart was not so. For she did not, she did not cease offering to divine justice the life of her son for our salvation. 
Therefore, we know that by the merits of her dolors, she cooperated with Christ in bringing us forth to the life of grace. And therefore, we are children of her sorrows. Aspergerius says, Christ wished her, whom he had appointed for our mother, to cooperate with him in our redemption. For she herself, at the foot of the cross, was to bring us, was bring us forth as her children. And if ever had any consolation entered into that sea of bitterness, namely the heart of Mary, it was this only one, namely the knowledge that by means of her sorrows, she was bringing, to, bringing us to eternal salvation. As Jesus himself revealed to St. Bridget with the words, my mother Mary, on account of her compassion and charity, was made mother of all in heaven and on earth. And indeed, these were the last words with which Jesus took leave of her before his death. This was his last remembrance, leaving us to her for her children in the person of John, when he said, as we heard in today's Passion, the Gospel, when he said to her, Woman, behold thy son. And from that time, Mary began to perform for us this office of a good mother. For as St. Peter Damien declares, the penitent thief, through the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary, was then converted and saved. Therefore, the good thief repented because the Blessed Virgin Mary, standing be be between the cross of her son and that of, the and that of the thief, prayed her son for him, thus rewarding by this favor his former service. And please note, as other authors also relate, this thief, the good thief, in the journey to Egypt with the infant Jesus, showed them kindness. And the same office the Blessed Virgin Mary has ever continued and still continues to perform by rewarding the kindness of sinners, which, which the good thief was in his early days. But, maybe, but Mary gained for him the grace of conversion at the foot of the cross for this kind act in the past. Therefore, we should have a love for Jesus on the cross, what we call, what Catholics call the crucifix. As one Benedict writer wrote over 100 years ago, the cross is a sign of our redemption. We revere it, salute it, and while bearing it, we adore our blessed Lord who died upon it for our salvation. No image is so widely circulated in Christendom and so highly venerated in the Catholic Church as the crucifix. Every altar upon which a priest offers the adorable sacrifice must have a cross with the sign of the cross as you and the sign of the cross is used at all the consecrations of Holy Church. And every truly Christian family holds a crucifix as the most treasured ornament in the home. How touching is the custom for the bride or bridegroom to bring to their new home a beautiful crucifix and give it an honored place in the home. This is proof that Jesus Christ crucified is the true Lord of their home. What silent sermons are given by a worthy image of our crucified Savior. From its place, it urges the family to have their hearts animated by Christian sentiments. It looks down so earnestly when the members of the family enjoy happiness and prosperity and so mildly and consolingly when they suffer misfortune. From his quiet place, hanging on the wall, the crucifix preaches of grace, of forgiveness, of patience, of charity. It warns and admonishes family members so mildly when some of them go astray on the way of sin. 
when this union, this union disturbs the peace and tranquility of the home, then from the silent lips of the crucified lamb who hangs on the wall come touching admonitions for forgiveness and reconciliation. All Christian families honor and venerate the crucifix. Jesus crucified is your true friend, the witness of all that happened in your family. How quickly the days and weeks pass, but he is always in your midst. He sees your children grow to maturity. He sees how loved ones are carried from your home in the coffin. He sees you in your happiness, and again he gazes upon you when your eyes are wet with tears. He is your, he is your truly only consoler, ever near to, comfor to comfort you in times of sorrow. As our Lord said in the Gospel of St. John 12, 32, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all things to myself. O may, the, o may the image of the crucified Savior draw the hearts of all members of the family to himself. Unite them in prayer and in charity. Keep them from the vanities of the world and be the true source of mutual love in the home. Indeed, the crucifix is in truth a school of all virtues. Our divine Savior taught St. Gertrude how we should look up to him as our model in our sufferings. When we hear our dying Savior pray for his enemies and excuse them before his Father with the words that St. Luke records, Father, forgive them, for they do not what they do. Should it then not be easy for us to love our enemies? In union with that love with which Jesus prayed for his enemies, we too should pray for those who injure us. One day, when St. Gertrude prayed thus for her enemies, our Lord was so pleased that he granted her the forgiveness of all her sins. And there are a couple things we, that are recommended by the church, approved by the church, to show our devotion to our Lord in his passion, and especially on the cruc this cruc dying on the cross. One is from, comes from St. Margaret Mary, Alacoque. It's called the 33 Adorations of Our Lord on the Cross, to be made, to made on Fridays of the week. And here's what its history and promise state and reveal to our Lord Real by our Lord to our St. Mary to Mary. This is what St. Mary to Mary wrote. One Friday during Holy Mass, I felt a great desire to honor the sufferings of my crucified spouse. He told me lovingly that he desired that every Friday I adore him 33 times upon the cross, the throne of his mercy. I was to offer these acts of adoration to the Eternal Father, together with the sufferings of his divine Son, to beg of him the conversion of all hardened and faithless hearts who resist the impulse of his grace. And our Lord told me, moreover, that at the hour of death, he will be favorable to those who have been faithful to this practice. And also, as the autobiography of St. Margaret Mary explains, these 33 acts of adoration of our Lord on the cross may be made anywhere on Fridays, even while attending to one's ordinary work. They require no special attitude or formula or vocal prayer. A simple look of love and contrition coming from the depths of our heart and sent up to our crucified Lord is sufficient to express our adoration and gratitude to him. It is also an appeal to the Blessed Virgin Mary to intercede with the Heavenly Father for the conversion of sinners. And the second recommended practice, which proved by the church and revealed by heaven to a few saints, it's in the Pieta prayer book. 
this, it was, it's part of the true letter of our Lord, of our Savior Jesus Christ, which has the uh, approval of Pope Leo XIII. And that true letter is the following. <clears throat> to all those faithful who shall recite for three years each day to our fathers, two Hail Marys and two Glory Bees, in honor of the drops of blood I lost, that is Jesus lost on his way, on his, in his suffering and passion, I will concede the following five graces. So it's to our fathers, two Hail Marys and two Glory Bees every day for three years. These are the, this is what our Lord promised for those people who do this faithfully. The first grace, the plenary indulgence and remittance Remittance of your sins. The second grace, you will be free from the pains of purgatory. The third grace, if you should die before completing this, the said uh, practice, third years, that, I mean three years, I mean if you die like two years into this devotion, for you it will be the same as if you had completed them. And the fourth grace, it will be upon your death the same as if you had shed all your blood for the holy faith. And the fifth grace, I will descend from heaven to take your soul and that of your relatives until the fourth generation. These are five wonderful graces for so little. It's two Our Fathers, two Hail Marys, and two Glory Bees every day for three years. I leave sorrows, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.